So I'm originally from Vancouver, Canada, where I studied uh, and worked as a civil engineer. I worked on hydrology um, problems, kind of trying to figure out how or model how much water would fall into different places uh, to cover up mine deposits or to cover up or, or to power um, electrical power plants. Um, I went to uh, France to do my master's in business and uh, a little divergence here. Um, I like to think about like all the people that uh, also brought me here today and DJ Patel did a talk about um, where data science came from this morning. And when I was in business school, there was that Harvard Business Review article that he was talking about with the sexiest um, job title in the world or whatever it was. And uh, I also read that article and I was like, I'm gonna become a data scientist. Um, so I left business school and went to the US uh, where I worked at a speech technology company. And uh, that's where I really got interested actually in machine learning. Um, and I, I then went on to work in data science and machine learning on uh, problems at Heroku uh, and then at GitHub. Um, GitHub, I spent time working on machine learning infrastructure and came to understand the importance of uh, resilient infrastructure for production and critical path uh, applications, and also uh, how difficult it is to take something that you trained, uh, a model you trained in a batch method on historical observations and put that into real time. Um, I left uh, GitHub to work a little bit on this problem and ended up um, working on Bitewax, uh, founded this company that also has the same uh, name for the open source project. Um, and I'm the CEO uh, there now, and it's a stateful, Python stateful stream processor. Um, and it came out of this idea of like, how can we make it easier to take um, whatever you did to data in a, in a batch um, um, process for training your model and put it in real time. And it kind of evolved from that uh, into something a bit, little bit more generally applicable. Anyway, when I'm not working on Bitewax, um, I like to stop in here, my daughter, she's 10 and a half months old and she's like the cutest thing ever, her name's Zaya. So I'm working on uh, learning how to be a dad, um, which don't ever do that at the same time as you start a company, it's <laughs> fucking exhausting. Um, so anyway, let's go on to getting real time. Um, oh shit, uh, this was supposed to be a joke. Um, and the joke was that I'm now going to explain to you, um, you know, how do you make, what is real time? How do you make real time happen? And there's like a, Airflow uh, file there for a, uh, to schedule a, uh, a job, and then you just change the uh, schedule interval from like 15 uh, minutes or five hours or whatever down to like 0 0.0001 seconds, and then you just see what happens and it blows up. Um, but obviously, this was too big or something. I don't really know, but the point uh, I'm trying to make is that it's uh, it's an area or a topic that we don't have a lot of consensus on in the industry. Like if you talk to someone today about uh, whether or not you need a, or more traditional analytical tools like a data warehouse or a BI layer or metrics and why we need metrics, et cetera, there's like quite a wide and broad consensus on why we need those tools, what they are, what they mean. Um, with as far as real-time data processing and the technologies that power that, I don't think we have the same understanding and consensus. So um, today what I want to do is talk about this topic, uh, real-time data processing. And uh, I hope that at the end of this, you'll have a little bit more understanding of why one would um, use real-time processing within the organization, the different types of uh, workloads that could be real-time, and then talk about two case studies from my time at GitHub um, that relate to this, and then a little bit about architecture. Um, but before we do that, uh, I'll just get some definitions out of the way. Everyone's in the streaming tr track right now, so they probably already know what these all mean, um, but it's the level set. So what is real time? Real time is defined uh, as anything that is perceived to happen in real time by a human, which is an extremely fuzzy definition, but quantitatively what that uh, means, it's, it's anything that happens in the sub-second realm. Um, uh, and real time can actually be uh, um, so, or real-time data processing can ap actually happen in both a batch and a stream processing fa fashion. Stream processing just refers to processing one uh, datum at a time that's flowing in a continuous stream, and batch processing, as you probably all know, is when you gather a batch of data and process it all at once. So when you get the batch smaller and smaller and smaller, 
uh, you can get closer to real time, and that's what um, Spark Structured Streaming does um, with micro uh, batches. So we've gotten all that out of the way. Now we can move into what we actually wanted to talk about, um, which is real-time processing and the different types of real-time workloads and uh, so on and so forth. So this is the first self-driving car. Mr. Bean was like really ahead of his time. Now this is, um, I, what I want to talk about here is that in our day-to-day -day lives, for helping us all understand uh, real time and why we need it, in our day-to-day -day lives, we're receiving like so much, so many inputs, like hundreds and hundreds of inputs, and we're reacting to those in real time. And one good example of this is driving a car. When you're driving a car, or maybe playing a sport. When you're driving a car or like playing a sport, you have a lot of inputs and your body is, your brain is like, you know, analyzing what's going on, you're reacting to it in real time. Um, and so you could imagine if we were to like make an analogy here to doing that in a batch or less real time manner, and you would like wait for a duration of time and all these inputs of all the systems going on around you, take all that information and then try to like forecast out what to do for the next like 15 seconds, it would be a complete disaster and you'd probably crash and your favorite sport would be uh, horrendous to play or watch. So that was just a kind of level set where we are in with respect to real-time processing. Um, and we could draw some conclusions here is that uh, in the instance of driving a car, we're kind of making like a life or death decision. And so maybe we need real-time processing for stuff like that. Or in the context of playing a sport, it's a elevated user experience. And so maybe in the case when there's a potentially elevated user experience, we want to move to real-time processing. But that's not very concrete and doesn't really help us uh, scale out our thinking around that. Um, so I'd like to uh, think about the two types of use cases uh, as analytical and operational uh, workloads. Sorry, not use cases. Um, Anal analytical use cases, analytical workloads, sorry, are workloads that require low latency, freshness, and also the capability of retrieval. Um, so the most obvious, you know, it has to be something that is queryable. And the most obvious uh, example that probably most of you have interacted with, on LinkedIn, you get a notification if your profile has been viewed. When you click into that like profile view notification, you're taken to a something that looks like that. I had 605 profile views, so I'm, you know, it's trending up. But anyway, you can see the historical data all the way up to the most fresh, the freshest data, should I say? So we have uh, this idea of freshness, and we're also able to query that data. We're able to filter it and change it, and so we're able to. Um, retrieve different dimensions of that data, let's say. So that's a, an example of a real-time analytical um, workload. Another example I have here is uh, this super fuzzy uh, picture is an uh, Instacart um, da, uh, order. So when you order from Instacart and then you're, um, you go into your, your uh, order and you can see the updated um, ETA. And so this is another example of an analytical um, real-time workload. On the other hand, operational workloads, um, as I've bucketed them uh, for the purposes of this talk, uh, you have low latency, you also have fresh freshness, but then you have this idea of it being reactive. Um, and so the idea there is that some of the uh, business logic or some of the decision making is actually uh, embedded in, in line uh, in whatever is supporting it. So if it's a, a streaming use case, it's inside the streaming processor. So there's, a, there's something happening to that data and a decision ma being made in, in line there. So one uh, good example of this is um, fraud detection. What you can see here is like a little text message uh, thing. So the fraud detection system, I think this was like a Chase, Chase Bank fraud detection system is... Um, basically taking all the inputs in real time uh, and then making a decision about them uh, without the kind of human in the loop. And then it, it makes a decision on what to do. And, and then it talks to this human and says, hey, I tagged this as fraud, like say yes or no. Um, another example of this is in the financial markets, uh, high frequency trading or some other types of trading. Uh, you're having, you have all these market signals happen, happening and then the um, the program, the software program, is making a decision uh, whether or not to buy or sell, and they're kind of competing on how fast that can, they can make that decision. 
Um, so one more thing I wanted to touch on here uh, with this brilliant illustration from Stable Diffusion uh, is this idea of um, the human in the loop versus the machine in the loop. So if you look at different examples across analytical and then at, across operational uh, workloads, there's this idea of like the human uh, kind of uh, being in the loop uh, or being more involved in the analytical and less involved uh, if or, or not involved in the operational. Um, and I think this is uh, best, um, the best example of this is coming back to that high frequency trading uh, about, I think it was like just over 10 years or about 10 years ago, there was a TED talk uh, that I saw that piqued my interest um, by a man named Sean Gurley. And he talked about this in the, the world of algorithms, I guess is what it was titled. And uh, he talks about in the financial markets when they started developing um, systems that could trade without human interference or whatever, uh, humans in the loop, um, they started to witness that there were these, these machines were like trading with each other. And so the machines could react to input, various different inputs, pit so, input sources and to each other before a human could even understand what was going on. And he like, you know, draws all this um, future and expands on this, uh, this world of the machines and how we're like the humans living in it. Um, all of this is, is really to summarize how uh, in the analytical use case, so if you find yourself uh, with something in your business where you think there's value to be derived and there's a human in the loop, there's probably a subset of tools within the real-time space that fall under this analytical, um, uh, analy analytical workload. And if you're building uh, algorithmic trading system or something where you believe that there's no, actually not a requirement for the human in the loop, um, you're more likely to fall under this operational um, category. Okay, so we talked about the two different types of real-time uh, workloads. Uh, next thing I wanna do is get a little bit more concrete with a couple of um, case studies of uh, decisions we made at GitHub for some of the products that you may or may not have um, used before. So the team I was a part of uh, was responsible for a few data products that ended up on github.com. Um, two of these were uh, these two lists. One is the trending repositories and the other is the trending developers. Um, and they're on the GitHub Explore page. Uh, if you um, have ever seen it before, Anyway, uh, so the, the trending repositories and trending developers were, uh, basically we took a series of, of actions that had happened to these different repositories and we would try to determine which ones were trending or not. So you have like stars, forks, views, stuff like that. Um, all of this data was available in a service that another team managed um, that was a, uh, that was um, a streaming platform. It was all, all available in Kafka. Um, and we did have the capacity to write it, uh, to make it so that we could have like a real-time trending product. Um, but we ultimately d made the decision not to uh, run it as a real-time product. And the reason that we did that uh, was first and foremost, our team was largely um, data scientists and machine learning engineers who had never worked with uh, streaming platforms or stream processors. Um, and the other thing that's probably more important is that this was a net new product. So uh, in like 2017 or 2018 is when this was shipped and we had no clue on the impact, what the impact of the Explore page would be and if it actually was going to provide value to the users of um, GitHub and if it would be sticky. So like if it would make them return back to the platform and get increasingly more value um, uh, from the platform if we moved that to real time. So we kind of stayed in our lanes with what we knew and we made the decision to uh, do this as a batch workload um, off of our, uh, you know, running some queries against Presto where the, real, the data landed from Kafka, uh, that, do it nightly, and then we would put it in a MySQL database and then it could be retrieved from github.com. Um, so this, uh, in fact, was not a real-time uh, workload, but could have been, and if it was, it would be a great example of a analytical use case uh, in the instance in which people uh, wanted to interact with this data in real time. So you could think about uh, how it might be interesting if you're a venture capitalist sitting in this 
um, field that you want to look at all the companies that have like trending stars and you want to kind of dive into that data. So if you wanted to be able to do that, it would be a great analytical uh, use case where the customer as a human is interacting with that data and they want the freshest and most real-time data. So the other uh, thing that we worked on uh, was star spam. And so this is a, a chart from a, a recent blog post from, I think it was like Dagster. I don't know, maybe there's someone from Dagster here. I don't think so. But anyway, uh, they were looking at uh, clearly what is uh, a fail of uh, GitHub to detect star spam, but um, that's not the real reason uh, I want to talk about star spam. So GitHub in some, uh, from, from one perspective is essentially like a multi-sided marketplace where you're matching uh, developers to open source projects. If you sort of squinted it, that's uh, what you could see. And a very important metric um, that many of us use is uh, stars. We use it as a proxy for um, the utility of the project uh, or maybe the health of the project and the community behind it. Um, and so <clears throat> if we were to not catch star spammers, uh, there would be a degradation of the value of the platform um, for at least one side of the marketplace, they would eventually leave and you'd have this sort of downward spiral of the overall value of the GitHub platform for the users and the open source projects. Um, at GitHub, we decided to, um, we, we, we decided to use uh, Flink and uh, we had the data available in Kafka so we could in some way, shape, or form, shadow ban some of these users. So um, I don't know what's really going on today. This was like two years ago. Um, so this is a perfect example of uh, operational processing um, where a decision was made to shadow ban a user based on a set of rules that we had outlined in code. So it was kind of auditable. And then that user would be um, submit to, uh, for human review. And then they could determine whether or not it was made erroneously or, or not. Um, while we're here on the subject of stars, um, I, I work uh, on ByteWax. So if you want to take a moment at some point in the near future and go to ByteWax slash ByteWax on GitHub and give me a star, that'd be great. Um, uh, yeah, so anyway, um, what I want to touch on next is like, uh, we did this like quasi real time, um, but I wanted to touch on just sort of the value of uh, making a decision in real time um, and how the latency is uh, related to uh, potentially to the re return on investment of a project and that's when you should make a decision to move it to real time. So in this instance, um, or in both these instances, uh, we can sort of talk about, um, the value of moving these either of these to real time. So uh, trending was related to stars because we use stars as part of the um, uh, input for to determining whether or not a uh, project should be trending or not. Um, and so in the instance in which we had, if we had decided to make trending a real time uh, product, it would be uh, even more necessary to maintain the value of the platform by doing this in, in as close to as real time as possible. Um, because part of the, I kind of want to be able to stand over here, part of the reason why we uh, promote projects, they get more stars. So if we had a lot of star spam and then you would end up on the training page, you would have this sort of like uh, spiral and this like gaming effect where you would have a really negative uh, response going on. Um, and this is going to lead me into this concept of uh, the value of a project um, versus the latency. So if you're to speak with, or if you were at earlier talks, I don't know, someone probably mentioned this today in the streaming track, um, that the value of data degrades over time. And they always say that it looks something like the, uh, the function that you see on the left. Um, but I think that the reality is, is that it does degrade over time, but most projects or most uh, data um, generally fall in the category of the S-curve on the right, where at some point the return or the value of that data um, kind of caps out 
uh, with respect to latency. Um, so as you move closer and closer. And when we look back at what we were just talking about with those two case studies, um, the trending project, or the trending and the, uh, the trending repos and trending developers, uh, there was actually only a fraction of the total traffic for github.com actually landed on that page. And it was in, we couldn't uh, um, attribute that there was a lot of value uh, generated from that product. Um, and so moving it to real time wouldn't have really had a, uh, a higher return on investment. And so in this instance, um, both of these ended up falling into this sort of curve where um, because the trending product actually didn't uh, increase in return on investment um, exponentially as we moved latency closer to zero, uh, we didn't have to look out for star spammers uh, in a millisecond um, type of time frame, and it was easy enough to catch them on the hours time frame instead. And so if we could like put hours here, like you know, the value degraded to a certain point, and then it just sort of uh, capped out. Okay, um, we've talked about the uh, relationship of the return on investment of a project with respect to latency. We've talked about um, the different real-time workloads. And I want to jump into a couple architecture slides. Um, many of you will probably be already be familiar with these. Um, these two architectures that I'm going to outline and uh, that's fine. I'm just going to give my opinion on some of this. Uh, what you have here is the Lambda architecture. Lambda architecture was coined like by Nathan Mars, I think, something like 12 years ago um, as a way to beat the cap theorem. Uh, essentially, what it is is you have uh, two um, separate processes going on, one in batch, one in streaming, uh, one in a stream process. And the batch process is kind of working at, at some time frame, like an hour or four hour or five hour or whatever, and it's going to be determined to be consistent. And then you can have a batch view on that. And then the real time is doing its best job to kind of fill in the gaps. Um, so then your application can query um, a near real time uh, data set between those two. Uh, what you can probably guess is this is very complicated to manage uh, because your application has to um, do a lot of work to uh, make sure it's uh, querying from the right places and, and uh, merging that data appropriately. And then you also have to manage two code bases um, across your project, essentially two code bases. Um, one of the pros, and <laughs> one thing that's kind of interesting is like most organizations just kind of like end up being here, like, or end up being here and like never get to that. But anyway, most organizations start with like a batch processing approach because it's like readily available. Um, you, you maybe don't know any real time use cases where you're actually going to get a lot of value and it just makes sense. Um, and organizations uh, grow organically. And if you took, uh, if you squinted the Lambda architecture, you could see a world in which you can. Uh, as required, you can add a, um, a stream, when a stream use case, streaming use case requires it, you could add this uh, additional layer and you could kind of grow organically from your batch system. Uh, shortly after Lambda architecture was coined, um, Jake Kreps, uh coined the Kappa architecture. Um, and you can see that it's like a lot more straightforward, but it relies on the systems to take on a, a large burden of of um, what was done in that uh, more difficult to maintain system. So the, like instantly you can see the application has a lot less burden. It's just gonna retrieve the data as required. Um, but then at the same time, your stream processing system, your streaming platform have a lot more burden on them. The streaming platform has to be your record of truth. It has to be durable and replayable. Um, and the stream processor has to be able to main state, uh, has to be able to track progress and all this sort of stuff. And so it's quite complicated. And what we got out of that was Kafka and Flink, which are both amazing pieces of software, but they're also very complex and very hard to maintain. Um, one thing that I believe is missing from the Kappa architecture, and this is because of my view as a data scientist, is that uh, first, it's very expensive to maintain data in the streaming platform. And so normally, you end up with some window of time that you keep it around, a retention period, like 30 days or whatever. Um, and so you can't query historical data as easily. But on that subject of querying historic data, it's very hard to ad hoc explore the data that's available in this system. Um, 
stream processors are extremely uh, powerful, but you generally need to know what you need to do and you need to know what you want out of the system so that you can write the code and then it can run. Uh, whereas most of the time when I'm writing code as a data scientist, um, I'm sort of doing it in an exploratory way uh, in an ad hoc fashion, trying to understand and get meaning from my data. Um, so it would be nice if I could do that. You probably have also heard of like a couple other um, architectures, data mesh and data fabric or uh, Delta, um, the Delta architecture, which is like Databricks one. Um, I'm not gonna talk about those. I haven't seen a lot of that usage yet, uh, the usage of those architectures yet. Um, so they're, they're still evolving, but there's, uh, I believe some merit. Uh, okay, so we've now, um, I've now presented my view of what real-time processing is, the different types of workloads, um, and tried to create sort of a framework for understanding of when you should uh, adopt real-time and why. Um, and now I'm going to talk about the technologies uh, and companies that are working in the space just briefly um, so you, you know what to look for and how to identify when you should use uh, the different technologies. Um, so it kind of looks like this. This isn't... All this is, these aren't all the companies, but these are a lot of the companies, and there's a lot here, right? When you look at this, you're like, holy shit, that's super overwhelming. And all of these companies, in some way, shape, or form, send a message like, we're the real-time processing platform, or we're the streaming platform. And so it's very difficult to understand what's going on. Um, and there's like a lot more that I probably didn't include here. So we could draw some lines. And we could put these into different groups. So we have like capture and ingest, and we could have streaming storage slash transport layer, and then the operational and the analytical processing I was talking about before. Um, there's some of these fit into multiple boxes, so it's, it's not perfect, but I did my best to put uh, technology where it could be used. Um, uh, so I'm, I might be wrong, right? Uh, and this is also still like very overwhelming. Um, so we can look at it one piece at a time. These are just three things. Uh, Snowplow is probably the most common behavioral um, data platform for capture and ingest. Debezium maybe is the most popular uh, CDC technology for, for uh, capturing it into um, a uh, storage platform. Buzz is a, a new tool from, uh, that is just very simple to validate and capture data. Um, uh, the industry has sort of, in some respect, adopted Kafka API almost as like the protocol. So all three of these uh, are Kafka API compatible, um, and they are transport layers that um, we see people using and that uh, we use, uh, um, you know, when we're building out demos with Bitewax or, or guides, et cetera, on how to build streaming systems um, or real-time systems. You have operational processing layer where the best, obviously, the best project is Bitewax. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Um, the most widely adopted project is Flink, and it's been around for like over 10 years or at least 10 years. Um, so it's e extremely powerful software. Uh, Spark structured streaming, um, which I mentioned at the very beginning, is another tool for doing some of this operational processing. Um, and is widely widely used, although it's generally what I hear is that it's more often used in the streaming world when it's a, a um, you have a very serious big problem that you're tackling and you can invest a significant amount of resources to manage it. Um, analytical processing, I put the streaming databases here, uh, even though the streaming databases probably uh, sit across both operational processing and analytical processing, and that's why people are excited about them. Uh, and if you uh, were here earlier, you would have heard Frank talk about Materialize, and so you already know what a streaming database is. Otherwise, there's three OLAP, um, real-time OLAP uh, solutions there, ClickHouse, Pinot, and Druid, which are, I see as the most common. Tiny Birds on ClickHouse, Star Trees, Pinot, Druid is Imply, I think. Um, the idea behind a real-time OLAP database uh, seems to be... Um, something that you're like, oh, I don't know really when I need that or why I need that. Um, 
it's like I outlined in the analytical processing, it's when it needs to be queryable, uh, it has to have the freshest data, um, and you need to be able to query it at low latency. And so that's when those generally uh, fit in. The one difficult thing about a real-time OLAP database is um, they kind of fall apart with the concept of joins because you can't, joins are expensive as we all know. Um, and so you need to do a lot of your processing before it gets into the uh, real-time OLAP database so that your queries actually um, happens within a reasonable amount of time. Uh, and so you generally end up with a pipeline that looks like Kafka or whatever to Flink to do some more, some joins and some processing and then over to Pino or ClickHouse. Um, and once again, that's where maybe the streaming databases can uh, simplify this entire experience. Um, in fact, I think at some, in some point in time, Materialize will probably do three of these, or maybe they already do, or, or all of them, but uh, we'll see how things turn out. Um, okay, so you might have thought that was it, but I have uh, one more thing. Um, it's the Zaya architecture. Now, I just put her in here because she always gives me applause regardless of how good my presentation is. Now, I, I, this was a, like a little thought process of a, um, something that I, I'll put a GitHub repository up about at some point. Um, from my perspective, uh, coming from machine learning and data science background, this is an architecture um, that I would use uh, frequently and I use frequently in my um, guides and demos uh, trying to explain to people when you would use something like this. So uh, I select Red Panda often as a streaming platform because it's a lot easier for me to manage and it's a single binary, um, but it's still Kafka compatible, so I can use the same API, Biwax, for the um, stream processor. And then as a downstream system, uh, depending on what I want to do, I can write that data out to S3 or over to Redis, and then my application can have access to the data. Redis could be subbed in. You could have something like Cassandra, or you could have the real-time OLAP database there. Um, and then if I dump data into S3, I don't know if anyone here has ever heard of this thing called DuckDB, but uh, I've heard it a couple times at this conference, so maybe people have. Um, yeah, it's an easy way to query that data uh, because you could write it out of Biwax into Parquet files and then query those uh, in a performant manner. So I'll leave you all with that. Um, once again, it's Bytewax, B-Y-T-E-W-A-X, github.com slash Bytewax slash Bytewax. If you want to check it out, um, yeah, thank you for all for listening.